Good evening. NATO defense ministers have just uh, held an extraordinary meeting uh, addressing COVID-19 and NATO's uh, response. We have done so uh, by secure video conference. This was a timely and substantive um, discussion. We reviewed uh, our response to the pandemic and we agreed uh, on the next steps we need to take to continue to support each other uh, and support our partners. COVID-19 represents an unprecedented challenge to our uh, nations. It has a profound impact uh, on our people uh, and our economies. And it is imposing historic shocks on the international system, which could have long-term consequences. The crisis has shown that our nations are resilient and united. Our militaries are already playing a key role in support of uh, national civilian efforts. And using NATO mechanisms, uh, allies have been helping each other to save lives. <clears throat> NATO's top, in, uh, top uh, operational commander, General Walters, uh, was tasked by foreign ministers two weeks ago to coordinate military support. And today he updated uh, us on uh, his efforts to ensure NATO uses its military resources most, um, uh, most effectively. Military forces from across the Alliance have uh, flown uh, more than 100 missions uh, to transport medical personnel, supplies and treatment capabilities facilitated the construction of 25 field hospitals, added more than 25,000 uh, treatment beds, and uh, 4, uh, 000, over 4,000 military medical personnel have been deployed in support of civilian efforts. Today, I encouraged uh, all allies to make their um, capabilities available so uh, General Walters can coordinate further uh, support. I welcome uh, the additional offers made by ministers today. All NATO allies are affected by the pandemic, but not in the same way at the same time. So when uh, uh, we effectively coordinate our resources, uh, we make a real uh, difference. Defence ministers also addressed NATO's continued deterrence and defence. The bottom line is that security challenges have not diminished uh, because of COVID-19. On the contrary, potential adversaries will look to exploit the situation to further their own interests. Terrorist groups um, could be emboldened, the security situation in Afghanistan and Iraq remains fragile, and we see a continued uh, pace of Russian military activity. So we must maintain our deterrence and defence, because our core mission remains the same, to ensure peace and stability. While we continue to take all the necessary measures uh, to protect our armed forces, our, op our operational readiness remains undiminished. And our forces remain ready, vigilant and prepared to respond to any threat. We also discussed uh, the importance of countering disinformation, both from state and non-state actors. Trying to solve division uh, in the Alliance and in Europe uh, and to undermine our democracies. We are countering these false narratives uh, with facts and with concrete actions. We're also working even uh, closer with allies and the European Union to identify, monitor and expose this information and to respond robustly. Finally, we considered the long-term implications of this health crisis for our societies and for the world around us. The geopolitical effects of the pandemic could be significant. Some may seek to use the economic downturn as an opening to invest in our critical industries and infrastructure, which in turn may affect our long-term security and our ability to deal with the next crisis when it comes. So ministers had an in-depth discussion on how we prepare for the long-term effects of COVID-19. 
it is too soon to draw the final conclusions, but it is clear that we must further bolster the resilience of our societies, better plan for pandemics in the future, protect our critical industries, and improve our business continuity planning. Ministers agreed a set of recommendations to strengthen our resilience by updating our existing baseline requirements for civil preparedness based on the lessons uh, uh, from the crisis and by working even closer with our international partners. So it is significant that today we were uh, also joined by the European uh, Union, by the uh, EU High Representative and our close partners Finland and Sweden. Because COVID-19 is a threat to all of us and together uh, we can emerge stronger from this unprecedented crisis. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you, Secretary General. We now start with a question by Skype from uh, Brooks Stigner from Jane's Defence. Brooks, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you for the time, Secretary General. Two quick questions. Uh, as you mentioned, the COVID crisis will impose huge pressure on Europe's leaders to favor probably economic spending over defense. First of all, uh, do you think there should be a temporary respite for the Allies' pledge to reach the 2% GDP spending goal by 2024? I assume you'll say no, but should this idea at least be considered? Second question, resilience. In operational areas such as air and sea lift, satellite comms and energy, the Allies rely heavily on expensive standby contracts with commercial suppliers. Question, do you think the Allied uh, militaries need to start maintaining this on their own, moving away from so many commercial suppliers in order to increase their resilience? Thank you. So first on resilience, uh, we have agreed that, of course, uh, we will uh, uh, look into uh, uh, the consequences for our resilience planning uh, when we uh, learn the lessons from uh, this crisis. Uh, and we have initiated that work at the meeting today uh, to, uh, uh, to look into the medium and long term consequences, including how to further strengthen our resilience so we are prepared for the next uh, crisis. Um, uh, uh, we have in NATO uh, developed over uh, a long period of time uh, baseline requirements for resilience in uh, seven different areas, uh, health, mass, mass casualties, uh, transportation, infrastructure, telecommunications, uh, 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 continuity uh, of uh, government and, and other areas. So, so, of course, when we update these baseline requirements, we'll take into account the lessons learned from uh, the crisis we face uh, uh, now. What, will, what, what, what the concrete outcome will be, I think it's a bit too early to uh, say, but, uh, but the, the, all allies have some homework to do based on uh, what we see uh, in this COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, let me also add that, uh, well, of course, there are challenges and, 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 and there are lessons to be learned. Uh, but uh, I would like to highlight two things. One is that our immediate focus now is not to, what should I say, look into the long-term consequences. Uh, the time uh, will come where we have to do that. Our immediate concern now is to actually address the crisis as we face it today, to help to save lives and to mobilize as much support as we can. And uh, Sarkar briefed us on uh, what NATO allies and NATO is doing, and it is significant the way the military, NATO, provides support to the civilian efforts to uh, combat uh, uh, COVID-19 or the coronavirus. And I also think that actually, the, for instance, the airlift capabilities, uh, the medical um, uh, evacuation or the ability to transport patients, uh, uh, field hospitals and many other parts of resilience has proven extremely uh, uh, valuable and very operational uh, in the midst of this uh, COVID-19 crisis. So, of course, uh, there are always things that can be improved, but I think also we have seen that uh, uh, NATO as a, as a, as a crisis uh, uh, alliance or an alliance which has been prepared for crisis for decades, actually, uh, and the military uh, actually play a very important role in providing support to 
the civilian efforts dealing with the crisis. When it comes to economy and, uh, and budgets, um, of course, there will be economic consequences of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we have seen a significant, uh, significant reduction in, uh, in, in GDP. Uh, we have seen uh, forecasts about uh, further reductions. And of course, there will be budget uh, consequences. Uh, at the same time, I think it's a bit too early to, uh, uh, to say how big those consequences will be, because that uh, will uh, not least depend on how long uh, the crisis will, will last. Uh, second, uh, what we have seen is that, is that uh, in investing in military capabilities uh, is not only important to address military threats, but having military capabilities is also extremely helpful addressing uh, a health crisis. Um, uh, uh, the military provides a surge capacity, uh, which is now uh, um, proven uh, or, 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 or which is now <clears throat> uh, um, becoming very important or uh, is important for, for, for the civilian society as they uh, combat uh, uh, the co corona uh, virus. So, so it highlights that investing in military is uh, not only a way to deal with military threats but also with other threats and uh, challenges. Uh, and I think that's a good thing, uh, um, proving that uh, the armed forces, the military can help the civilian societies. Uh, so, uh, Jovana Juricic uh, from Daily Pobeda in Podgorica. Do you have plans for sending, sending uh, NATO contra hybrid teams to Western Balkan countries? I mean, Western Balkan countries who are NATO member, member states to help them to cope with uh, propaganda is, and disinformation in time of the pandemic. Thank you. There has been no request for uh, NATO sending uh, counter uh, uh, hybrid uh, teams. Uh, we have done that before to Montenegro, but there has been no request for uh, doing this uh, now. And actually, I think that the most important thing NATO can do is uh, to send uh, concrete support. And, uh, and uh, uh, countries uh, uh, in the Western Balkans have uh, have received uh, support uh, from NATO and NATO allies, uh, especially North Macedonia um, highlighted that very much during the meeting. This was the first meeting, uh, first ministerial meeting where, where a defence minister from North Macedonia participated and, uh, and uh, Minister uh, uh, Radmila Sekrinska um, listed how many NATO allies uh, um, uh, uh, the Netherlands, uh, the United States, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, uh, Norway, and many of the NATO allies have provided concrete support uh, with medical equipment, a field hospital, uh, financial support, uh, um, and so on uh, to North Macedonia. Uh, uh, and, that's, uh, and I think that's the best way, uh, both to provide concrete support to allies, as, we, uh, as NATO and NATO allies do uh, every day, uh, but it's also the best way to counter any attempt uh, to, uh, to, to, to conduct uh, disinformation campaigns. Because by acting, uh, we uh, send a clear uh, message. So, so we, uh, we uh, provide support to our allies in the Western uh, Balkans. Uh, but uh, today we also um, uh, discussed with our uh, uh, Supreme Operational Commander, General Walters, uh, how we can uh, speed up and step up uh, their support. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to Terry Schultz from Deutsche Welle NPR. Everyone over there. Um, Mr. Secretary General, um, you mentioned this just briefly in your introduction. Um, but already before COVID hit, there were concerns that China in particular was buying up important military assets throughout Europe. Now that companies um, and countries are going to be suffering um, serious economic consequences and some of these assets, some of the owners of these assets may need to sell, is it really too early to start reminding of the message that they need to keep um, important assets that could be useful for, for NATO um, in national hands? And also, did anyone bring up around the table, especially with Joseph Burrell there, concerns about the U.S. Uh, cutoff of funding for the WHO? Um, there have been comments about this on the EU side, and I wondered what your thoughts were on that or if any allies expressed concerns about that. Thanks. 
Do we had an in-depth discussion about uh, the, the, the uh, medium and long-term effects, uh, including on our resilience, and, uh, and many allies highlighted the importance of uh, uh, critical industries, uh, infrastructure, as part of our resilience. And resilience is a NATO responsibility. It's enshrined in our uh, founding treaty in Article uh, 3. Uh, so uh, so uh, reliable infrastructure, uh, reliable telecommunications, uh, 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 governments which can function also in times of crisis, uh, all these issues are of great importance for the civilian society, but also for, uh, for our military uh, uh, readiness and uh, preparedness. So, so this is very much interlinked. Uh, I'm not saying that it's too early to remind allies on the importance of uh, uh, focus on this and making sure that we uh, uh, have a resilient uh, uh, critical infrastructure uh, uh, industries and that we are uh, able to, for instance, provide critical uh, <coughs> equipment uh, during crisis as we uh, see uh, today. Uh, actually, that's, uh, that's, that's something which we have already addressed, and I highlighted that also in the meeting uh, today. And, 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 and the fact that we will now most likely have an economic downturn uh, may uh, uh, make some allies more vulnerable for, um, for situations where uh, critical infrastructure can be sold out. Uh, and, uh, and that can uh, undermine our, our resilience. So, so I convey that message, but also many allies convey that message during uh, the meeting. Uh, so no, it's not you know, any way too early to, uh, to highlight or to underline that message. Uh, what I said was a bit too early was to draw the final conclusion about what will be the outcome our, uh, our, uh, from our next uh, update review of the resilience guidelines, because that will not necessarily take some time. And, and, and our focus now is uh, on saving lives and uh, addressing the, uh, uh, the, 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 the concrete um, consequences of the uh, current crisis we are uh, faced uh, with. Um, the WHO uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is an intergovernmental organization. Uh, uh, NATO is not a member of that organization, but uh, uh, NATO has um, used the guidelines uh, from the WHO to uh, uh, implement preventive measures uh, uh, in NATO, in NATO missions and operations here at the NATO headquarters, NATO command structure. Uh, and, uh, and I believe in the importance of uh, international cooperation and, uh, and uh, transparency. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, since we are not a member, we will not uh, um, assess uh, how the organization is, 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 is working, but uh, we have used the guidelines provided by uh, WHO uh, to implement uh, preventive measures in NATO. Thank you. We can now go to Kabul uh, and uh, Hashnud Nabizada from Hama Press. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. I have now a question, uh, a question for you on Afghanistan. How will the uh, recent political developments and the U.S.-Taliban peace deal affect NATO mission in Afghanistan? Thank you. Well, NATO allies and NATO have expressed support uh, to the uh, agreement between uh, the U.S. and the Taliban and uh, to support uh, the peace efforts we have uh, uh, decided uh, to uh, 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 adjust uh, our troop uh, levels in Afghanistan from currently uh, roughly 16,000 down to 12,000. Uh, but we have also said that uh, um, any reduction will be conditions based and uh, that uh, uh, we remain committed to Afghanistan and uh, that we will uh, continue to provide training, uh, assistance, and also financial uh, support. Um, and we have to understand that even at the level of 12,000, uh, we will be able to continue uh, the mission operations uh, very much as we have done for, many, for several years now, because we were actually almost at that level uh, until 2017. Then we had an increase to 16,000. Now we are back again. Uh, almost at uh, the same level we had before the increase in 2017. So the NATO troop levels have been, um, uh, has, uh, has been adjusted before, up and down, uh, and, uh, and uh, we have conveyed the clear message that uh, 
uh, what we do in Afghanistan will be conditions based. So, so, so NATO's mission uh, message me message is that we went into Afghanistan together. We'll make uh, the decisions on, on adjusting our postures together. And when the time is right, we'll, of course, leave together. But we will leave when uh, the conditions are in place uh, for reducing further our uh, presence. Uh, we actually believe that the best way we can support the peace efforts is to continue to support the Afghan security forces. Uh, by uh, and uh, by doing that, sending a message to Taliban that they will not win, not win on the battlefield. They have to sit down and, and make real compromises on the negotiating table. We call on Taliban to respect the peace uh, uh, or the agreement uh, with the US to reduce violence and uh, to uh, sit down and engage uh, uh, in, um, in uh, uh, inter-Afghan negotiations. It is also important that the political uh, 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 challenges we see on the government side uh, and in Afghanistan that they are addressed uh, and we need unity, we need a functioning uh, political process in Afghanistan, uh, not least to be able to fully engage in the peace uh, process. And from Kabul we can go to Bratislava and uh, Andrei Matyshak from Pravda, Slovakia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General. You said that uh, with the pandemics, uh, threats uh, haven't disappeared. And of course, you're absolutely right. Uh, so we have seen, but we have seen that uh, uh, the exercises uh, the Europe Defender stopped. We have seen how, how hard, high ranking officials were infected and, and uh, there are soldiers in quarantine in some countries. So uh, what about the discussion that pandemics can hamper uh, the operational readiness of, of uh, armed forces of the member states? Uh, will NATO look at this? And uh, do you think there will be some consequences how to prepare better from the military point of view for the next pandemics? Thank you. There will always be uh, lessons uh, to be learned after a crisis like the uh, corona crisis. Uh, so, of course, uh, there will always be a potential for, to further improve and strengthen our resilience and the way we uh, cope with this uh, kind of uh, crisis. <clears throat> and that's exactly also the reason why we, uh, we have uh, uh, started to look into more medium and long-term consequences for uh, for, as I say, for NATO and for, uh, for, uh, for our societies more in, uh, in uh, general. Uh, having said that, I think that what we have seen over the last uh, weeks is that uh, uh, NATO has been able to implement preventive measures uh, to minimize the risks for our personnel, to minimize the risk of uh, spreading the uh, virus, and we have done so by, you know, uh, implementing many of the measures that are implementing in, that have been implemented in the rest of the society, with social distancing, uh, washing hands, um, and also uh, reducing, um, uh, also uh, adapting some of our exercises, cancelling some exercises, uh, and uh, and other preventive measures. But at the same time, we have made sure that the readiness of our, of our forces uh, is in place. Uh, that we can deploy uh, uh, troops, forces, uh, if needed. Uh, we have maintained our missions and operations, including the battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance, uh, our air policing, our naval deployments, and, uh, and uh, our missions from Afghanistan uh, to, uh, to Kosovo. So yes, of course, there have been consequences, uh, and we have uh, uh, implemented preventive measures, and of course also some military personnel have been infected and some are in quarantine, but this has not undermined uh, our ability to, uh, uh, to react, our operational readiness, and we maintain our missions and operations uh, despite uh, the preventive measures uh, we have implemented. The next question comes from Helene Cooper, the Pentagon correspondent of the New York Times, and I'm actually going to read it because she's not on the line. Uh, her question is, NATO countries spend so much time preparing for the next big war and battling traditional adversaries around the world, 
but the single virus has managed to cripple infrastructure, economies and health systems far and wide. Should the alliance broaden its definition of what makes an adversary? Shouldn't public health pandemics get more attention when calculating defensive posture? So that's the question from uh, the New York Times. The COVID-19 crisis have, uh, has reminded us all about uh, uh, how vulnerable we all are uh, uh, against the um, uh, health crisis, uh, against the virus as the COVID-19 uh, 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 um, crisis. Um, um, and I think uh, there are many lessons to be learned and much homework to be done after this uh, crisis. At the same time, I think that NATO is a security alliance. Uh, our task is to address uh, 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 potential military threats, uh, security threats. And we do that also by adapting and changing uh, and modernizing to new and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and challenging threats, like, for instance, the threats we see in cyberspace, terrorism, uh, 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 space, uh, where we uh, now establish a new command, uh, uh, cyber new command, and also the way NATO has adapted after the end of the Cold War, and, and, actually, and also the way NATO has adapted after, after 2014 when Russia illegally annexed uh, Crimea. So NATO has to adapt, NATO has to change, but I don't think that NATO um, should go into and be, what should I say, uh, the first responder or, or the main responder to uh, uh, a health crisis. What NATO should do and what NATO is doing uh, uh, is that we should support the civilian efforts um, to fight this health crisis. And that's exactly what we do. Uh, we see around the whole world and uh, uh, across all NATO allies that military personnel uh, are uh, playing a key role in the fight. Uh, field hospitals, transportation of patients in a safe way, um, uh, uh, airlift of equipment, of, uh, of, uh, of protective uh, um, uh, gear, of, uh, of medicine, uh, and so on, is done by military planes. Uh, and, uh, and we see that uh, military personnel are doing everything from uh, disinfecting public spaces uh, to uh, controlling border crossings. Uh, and NATO is playing a key role in mobilizing, uh, coordinating, uh, deploying, uh, um, um, support uh, to different NATO allied uh, countries and setting up uh, uh, field hospitals and so on. So I think that the main lesson for NATO and for the rest of the society is that uh, there is a close link between the civilian efforts to fight a health crisis and the ability of the military to support those efforts. Uh, and that's exactly what we are doing, and that's exactly what we also have to look into how we can do even better uh, when uh, uh, the next crisis uh, hits us. So, uh, so um, I don't think it's the need to change NATO's, what I say, core responsibility, a security alliance, but it is uh, uh, good reasons. There are good reasons for looking into how we can further strengthen the, the cooperation between the civilian society combating a health crisis and military capabilities providing support to, uh, to, to those civilian efforts. Because the fact that we have a health crisis doesn't mean that uh, more traditional security threats disappears. They are still there. Uh, terrorist organizations are still out there. Uh, cyber threats are still real. And we see uh, uh, more assertive Russia uh, continue to support the separatists in eastern Ukraine, uh, which are violating the ceasefire uh, again and again. Or we see uh, Russia being, being present in Syria, uh, making uh, it possible for Assad to do what he does against his own uh, population. And we see uh, also many other challenges and threats. So, so, so we don't have the luxury of saying that we can focus only on one type of threats. Then we need to focus and be able to mobilize against health threats at the same time as we remain strong um, and vigilant uh, uh, addressing uh, all the other threats, including uh, security threats. Thank you for the next question. We'll go to Lailuma Sadid from Afghan Voice. Uh, thank you, Secretary General, and good evening. Uh, yesterday, you said the Taliban attacks are harmful. Why NATO is not pressuring on the Taliban to accept ceasefire? And also regarding to the impact of COVID-19 on the NATO troops and their mandate in Afghanistan, 
does need to continue the training of Afghan army due to the coronavirus. Thank you very much. NATO is putting pressure on uh, on the Taliban uh, by providing support to the Afghan uh, security forces, by by maintaining our uh, rescue support mission, which is a, 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 a train assist and advice mission, uh, and uh, and actually following closely supporting the Afghan uh, forces. Uh, we also have, uh, of course, in the U.S. being present uh, partly in the uh, NATO mission, but the U.S. also has. Uh, 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 some activities outside the NATO mission, and altogether this is putting a significant pressure on uh, Taliban. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so we, don't, we call on them to reduce violence, uh, to fully engage in, in, in peace negotiations, but, uh, the, but we do that not only in words, but also in deeds, um, by uh, uh, um, continuing our presence in Afghanistan and, and continuing to support the Afghan security forces, also with funding. Um, um, of course, COVID-19 um, is also something we have to take into account when we uh, conduct our uh, mission, our activities in Afghanistan. And uh, there are uh, some people who have been infected uh, in our uh, um, some, some of the personnel in the rescue support mission, as we have seen all over the world and in many other uh, uh, places, um, but including also among the soldiers deployed in Afghanistan. Uh, so there are some uh, who are infected, uh, tested positive, and some uh, have been quarantined. Um, uh, but I think also what we have seen is that NATO has been able to deal with that. Uh, we have actually transported out of Afghanistan those who have been affected. Uh, they are getting treatment uh, uh, other places as the, the, the NATO so, uh, so soldiers who have been infected. Uh, and, uh, and we are making sure that the soldiers who are coming in uh, are in quarantine. So we are uh, certain that they don't bring uh, uh, the virus to Afghanistan. On top of that, um, uh, we are not only protecting our own personnel, but we're also providing support to the Afghan security forces. Uh, medical equipment, but also training, uh, advice in how to cope with the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. So, so we maintain our military presence. We uh, continue to put pressure on Taliban, uh, as we also then provide support to the Afghan security forces in, uh, in, uh, in fighting the uh, COVID uh, or the coronavirus. Thank you very much. And now for our last question, we go to Bucharest, uh, Radu Tudor from Antena 3. Thank you, Juana Lungescu. We can hear you, Radu. Go ahead. Uh, Secretary General, uh, I want to ask you if you can detail for us a bit about the uh, United States proposal to enhance the institutional uh, projection of NATO for transport capabilities for uh, the allied uh, countries in uh, the pandemic crisis. And uh, the second question, if you have discussed today with the defense ministers the uh, extremely aggression ret rhetoric of Russia and China especially and uh, on the online uh, uh, ways of communication here in eastern europe and especially in romania we feel that this aggression is trying to persuade uh, against the western values with uh, this hybrid war coming from russia and china thank you so much uh, so first on uh, the um, airlift uh, uh, issue um, uh, NATO allies and the United States, uh, as one of them, have already provided uh, significant uh, airlift uh, support to NATO allies, uh, transporting medical equipment uh, uh, around the globe uh, to, uh, to European NATO allies, and also transporting patients uh, in, a, in, a, in a safe way uh, from uh, one NATO ally to another uh, to provide medical care, uh, and also uh, transported uh, 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 medical personnel, um, and uh, and uh, Sakur informed us that uh, so far there have been over 100 uh, uh, flights uh, where uh, uh, NATO allies have helped each other in different uh, ways responding um, uh, to uh, this uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the United States has also uh, um, uh, instructed its uh, its uh, uh, top uh, commander in uh, Europe. 
uh, to uh, make available uh, US uh, capabilities, including airlift capabilities in Europe uh, to support uh, European NATO allies. So uh, Romania is one of the allies which have uh, benefited from uh, these airlift capabilities. And uh, these are airlift capabilities which partly allies have uh, uh, by the also national capabilities, like for instance the US that now provides uh, support to all the NATO allies with US capabilities. And partly we have some multinational uh, 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 so, uh, solutions for providing uh, airlift capabilities for allies uh, together. But anyway, it's uh, it's about NATO providing or NATO allies providing support to each other, uh, addressing the uh, the Corona uh, uh, crisis or the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. Um, uh, the, the other was about uh, the, uh, some, uh, hybrid. Well, as we have seen, we so we have to be prepared, uh, and we also see in examples that uh, that. Uh, 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 state actors, non-state actors uh, may try to take advantage of this crisis. Uh, and that's the reason why we have to be vigilant uh, in, in addressing also them as we provide support uh, to the uh, civilian efforts fighting uh, the uh, COVID uh, crisis as such. Uh, we, we have to make, be aware that there is a potential for terrorist groups taking advantage of the situation. Uh, and we have to be vigilant and, and addressing many other challenges and threats at the same time. One part of this is also to address um, disinformation, uh, which has one aim, and that is to divide us and uh, to weaken our unity. Uh, and that uh, 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 could have, if they succeed, it, it, it can have long-term uh, negative consequences uh, for our unity. Uh, uh, we have, for instance, uh, seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, um, uh, uh, social media being used in a very active way to spread absolutely uh, wrong uh, uh, accusations about uh, uh, what NATO allies do uh, in fighting the uh, coronavirus and, and how we actually um, uh, are mobilizing together. Uh, uh, so, 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 so to address these issues. Uh, uh, this information is of great importance uh, for uh, all of us. I have said before, and I would like to repeat again, that I believe that the best response to this information and propaganda is free and independent press, is the work of journalists, uh, because when they check their facts, when they, when they uh, check their sources, uh, when they ask the difficult questions, uh, then this information and propaganda will never, never uh, uh, succeed. Uh, then I will say to all of you, uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and thank you for joining me at this uh, virtual press conference this evening.